Everyday Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife biologists, educators, game wardens, and other staff members report to locations spanning Maine's fields, forests, lakes, and labs, and trucks, boats, on snowmobiles and ATVs. I'm Katie Yates, and this is Season 1 of Fish and Game Changers. There are over 100 game wardens currently protecting Maine's resources, but just three of them are women. Game warden Sarah Miller is one of them. I meet up with her at her gray headquarters where she's changing the oil and putting away her patrol boat for the winter. Then we jump into her cruiser to scout for spots to catch night hunters in the act. Night hunting for deer is illegal, and as Sarah points out, it's an obvious, intentional violation. But to catch a night hunter, you have to cruise around during the day to find where you'll hide at night. Driving around with Sarah, I get the chance to hear about her unique journey to becoming a game warden. She didn't grow up in a hunting and fishing family, like you might expect. She was drawn to the opportunity to interact with her community and be a positive role model for young people and women interested in the outdoors. So what would an ordinary day consist of, typically? Um, well, it's hard to make anything typical. I mean, this time of year, uh, we're doing a lot of our homework for the hunting season. So I'll get up in the morning, I um, have my coffee, do some paperwork, and then get out the door. And then I'll, I'll try to go find some places that either I want to walk, um, that I'm unfamiliar with, places that I know in the past people frequently hunt uh, for a particular species. Last week was our moose week. I was actually out some long days with that. There was actually a few moose tagged right in my area. It's mostly checking a lot of hunters. Being a game warden, maybe more so than other law enforcement, I think there's more variation. Hmm. In the summer, you might be doing stuff on the water and with fishing, and then in the winter, maybe ice fishing and snowmobiles, so there's a seasonality. Oh, absolutely. You know, and for me, that's what makes it so much fun. Like I tell people, I get bored pretty easily. (laughs) So this is the kind of job for somebody if you get bored easily, because... Once you get bored of one thing, you know, you get tired of working boaters over and over and ATVs are driving you nuts while snowmobile season's coming. So then you get to get out and get on the sled and come spring, you'll be tired of sledding and ready to move on to fishing. And so, yeah, things cycle every year. So, and that does get fun. And what, what do you think is your favorite season to work? Fall by far. Yeah. The hunting season. Yeah. Something about it, just the energy and, and we get to do a lot of the work that a lot of us became game wardens to do, which is the hunting enforcement and there's still some fishing as well so spring fishing is fun too but um but fall is working night hunters what does that mean working night hunters is mostly you're out at night you're in the dark um i find it a lot easier to hide just you and whoever may be trying to cause some trouble and um, it's a real cat and mouse sometimes and how do you pick a spot to do that um sometimes it's based on information um sometimes you might get somebody that says hey you know there's somebody that's been lighting up this field or um, they might call in and say, "Here, hey, I heard some shots from over this way or that way. Um, a lot of times it's just you you learn in your career like what kind of makes an ideal night hunting spot. Um, and so you start to focus on those areas in your district that kind of match that. We've got some details coming up. So today I'm going to try to locate some areas where I could possibly set up and, and wait and watch. Um, I've got a few that I've used in the past, but it's always good to try to mix it up, change it up, find new spots to sit. Because, you know, there's like nobody else out, you know, you get to sneak around. It doesn't happen very often when you get a night hunter, but when you do, it's quick. Um, it happens so instantly, sometimes you, you don't even realize what's happening until it's happening. And it, I mean, obviously, a night hunter is an extremely intentional violator. Mm-hmm. They know exactly what they're doing. So there's no question of, you know, whether or not they, maybe they just didn't know, or maybe they forgot, or, you know, this, they absolutely know what they're doing. While we're driving around, Sarah sees hunters she knows from her community. She rolls down her window and gives them a hello. Out looking for the birds today? See ya. Then we take the long way back to Gray so she can show off some of the great region where she works and recreates. Around here, nothing is flat 
absolutely nothing. <laughs> so so no matter where you are, you're going up a hill and down another and up another hill and down another. You go hiking a lot. There are a ton of hikes around, just right around my area, little stuff you know, that are fun. Um, the Hoosick Land Trust has been buying up a lot of land and putting in a lot of hiking trails. And, you know, they're, they're pretty good. They put in parking lots and, and areas and things like that. And they advertise quite a bit. But it's all stuff that's local, you know, and it's not crazy hard hikes or anything. It's, it's something that's very accessible to a lot of people. In five minutes of my house, I mean, I can be to a trailhead. Um, and the Appalachian Trail is probably another ten minutes in the other direction. That's you know? cool. So it's, yeah, definitely a lot of little local opportunities. And as part of being a game warden, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to get out and be able to do a little bit more. It can be tough this time of year, but um, particularly in the early summer and late spring when it's not quite as busy it's hit some of these little small trails mm -hmm. um there's a lot of loops and things like that that they're putting in and you know you get somebody that gets hurt or lost on one of those areas it's important to know or at least have an idea what the terrain is like and, and what you're looking at and where it even is you know, sarah didn't like always want to be a game warden in fact she studied religion in college and she didn't pick up hunting until she was an adult. Is this the path that you knew you wanted to go on? Um, to? absolutely not. <laughs> I probably didn't. Absolutely not. I, I probably didn't even know what a game woman was until I was, oh, probably in t 20s. You know, I wanted to do something positive in my community and be a part of a community in that way and, and kind of, I guess, for lack of better terms, leave the world a little better place than how it was when I got here. And I think the only way to do that is to have a job where you can be very proactive. Um, so I was looking in law enforcement in general, and then at that point, um, not I hadn't been earlier. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So, but then I remember seeing an ad on TV, and they were talking about how they're looking for a game warden. I'd picked up hunting and fishing at that time, so I don't know. It just seemed like a good fit. So I just I started looking at what the requirements were, and once I decided that's the route I wanted to go, I just went with it. Um, yeah, it was like literally flipping a switch. It was like, this is what I'm going to do. You just knew. And I just knew. And uh, went with it and it worked out. So, but just for me, it's just being out there and being a part of all of it. If they ask who their game warden is, most people will know who their game warden is because it's that same person. And it's that community tie um, that it's, it's pretty crucial for us. I mean, it's those connections that bring forth information um, and earn people's trust, which is, which is huge. Did you think that was part of being a game warden before you became one? Um, it's something... That I'd have enough life experience when I came into it that I kind of was attracted to that part of it. And I think some of that stuff I picked up on some ride-alongs and just asking questions with other people who were game wardens at the time. Um, and I do remember, I believe, on my, my essay, um, the essay question on my exam was to the extent of, you know, what's the difference between a law enforcement officer or a typical law enforcement officer and a game warden. What are some of the differences? So that's actually coming into it. They wanted to know what your thoughts were on that. And, and a lot of my answer had to do with community. Um, and of course, the other big difference being you're outside all the time. The exam Sarah is referring to is part of the game warden hiring process. To learn more about the steps to becoming a game warden, visit mefishwildlife.com slash changers. I was in central Maine when I started. So I was out um, Charleston District, which is kind of between Dover, Foxcroft, and Bangor. It's a good place to start, um, kind of get my feet wet with it. I just love the mountains, absolutely love the mountains. And I like to have other hobbies that aren't work-related. I like to hike, I like to snowboard. Um, and so moving back to Western Maine, I was able to do that again. And the big reason, too, for the move is um, the 4-H camp at Bryant Pond. I'm very involved with a lot of what they do in the summer and their summertime programs. Camp Northwoods and Becoming an Outdoors Woman, or Bo are two programs offered at Bryant Pond in partnership with University of Maine's 4-H program. Every year, hundreds of young people and women learn important outdoor skills and gain confidence. Um, so for me to be closer to that camp and to be able to be more involved over a broader, um, broader I guess, aspect of programs that they have. Why do you like um, doing that? I don't know. For me, I, I really I connect with kids. I think there's a simplicity to them and an honesty to them that, that I really appreciate. Um, and that really is our future. Um, and I think I remember having positive role models when I was a kid and how much they influenced my life. And I'd like to be that for, for other kids. Um, and it gives me kind of a chance to be a big kid again. Um, so it just it's a, it's a fun place to be. Um, and I learn a lot of stuff. And you also help with Bo, too. 
yes, the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program there. And, um, I, you know, I wish I would had something like that when I was learning. <laughs> it would have been very helpful, but I, I think it's great. You can put all these women together and they can, you know, bounce ideas off each other. And then they have those connections um, that they can pursue outside of, of where they live. They can go meet up with other women from the program. And um, they've got other people to reach out to. So, and they're all, you know, pretty like-minded. So it's a pretty neat program. I think one of the things that was really amazing is this recent hunt. We had the, the mentor hunt, mm. you know, over on Swan Island. and, and being able Swan to- Island Wildlife Management Area, mentioned in last week's podcast with Michelle, is an island in the Kennebec River accessible by ferry from a boat launch in Richmond, Maine. In October 2019, the island hosted a mentored hunt. Sarah coached a new hunter who tagged her first deer the morning of the hunt. And being able to take somebody out and having them be successful in harvesting a deer and watching her reaction and and knowing that she's getting kind of the same thing out of it that I do when I would harvest a deer um, and how impactful that is on somebody. I always say it's probably the most empowering and the most humbling thing you will ever do um, if you go about it in the same way that I do. Um, you're not just out there killing something. It's so much more. It's such a different experience. Uh, and you can't really describe it until you're there. So to watch somebody else and help somebody else experience that and go through that, to me, that was that was pretty powerful. And I think those, those moments when you're with somebody else and it happens to them kind of remind you of why you do it and why you got into it. So, And I think it's important as a game warden to reconnect with that feeling because that's why we do what we do in our jobs so that this next generation coming up has that same opportunity and other people that haven't been able to do it before have that opportunity. So you didn't get into hunting and fishing until after college? I was very later in life when I did, yeah. And, I mean, I fished a little bit as a kid. We had no idea what we were doing, you know. <laughs> but um, but it was fun. My brother and I would go around. Um, growing up outside of Acadia National Park, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities. And, of course, when we were younger, it was a different world. So, you know, all those kids in the neighborhood would just hang out in little gangs and ride bikes and take fishing poles places, that kind of thing. But I, I never got into hunting until... Um, later in life um, and it was it was kind of tough to pick it up I'm very much self-taught and there's still a lot I learn every day about it but I'm kind of one of those people when I want to know something or learn something I just go nuts about it and just start researching and try and doing doing everything I can to learn how to do it and I kind of did that with hunting and um, what inspired you to get into hunting I just that connection with nature it's a very different kind of connection it's very real I mean you're putting yourself right back into this ancient tradition right back into the food chain you're very much a part of the earth that you're on um and that to me is is something that really attracted me it's it's also the the idea of self-sustainability knowing that you could survive you can do what you need to do to survive and uh, and part of a healthier lifestyle i mean deer meat's pretty much the good majority of the red meat that i eat um provided i get a deer (laughs) when i hunt it's typically on my own now i've learned that i i prefer to hunt on my own (laughs) You get that one person that, like, can't stop burping. Chews gum really loudly and, like, sitting there trying to open a Twinkie while you're sitting in the stand. Yeah, that drives me nuts. So now I prefer to be on my own. <laughs> but at first, it uh, it can be quite challenging. It's got to be hard to find time to do it. It can be. Um, in the hunting season, I'll find myself either going out early before work, maybe just taking a rifle with me and um, spending a couple hours in the woods before I start work, or sometimes I'll start work early and then go out and spend the last couple hours of the day. Um, even then, you're still tied to your phone, um, so you still want to be somewhere with decent coverage, and, you know, if something comes up, you got to turn around and go, that's fine, it happens. But um, you try to incorporate it as best you can with your work um, so that you get a little bit of it on your own, too. But, yeah, it, it is much more difficult to, to actually put a ton of time and effort into it. But our advantage is that we're in the woods a bunch more, throughout the year so you get to kind of do your little scouting on your own while you're working um so you get pretty good ideas of where to go and and stuff like that so i know people that would make an excellent game warden and the one reason they don't want to do it is because they want to hunt you know and you try to like you know bring them over and be like come on you're gonna still do it um but i empathize with them you know I, i know what they're saying now the the positive thing that i'm seeing is that i am checking just as many daughters in the field with their dads out hunting and moms out hunting that's as awesome. I am and boys so I think that's just organically naturally just going to kind of change I think you're going to see a lot more women getting into it just because the, the numbers are rising yes definitely so I don't I don't think there is as much at least not from my outside perspective as much of that stigma 
um, about women hunting as there used to be. With that, my hope is we'll get some more girls that want to be game wardens too. To learn more about becoming a game warden and the great work they do, visit emmyfishwildlife.com slash changers. That's emmyfishwildlife.com slash changers. Next week, I have a quiet conversation with a wildlife biologist who focuses on secretive marsh birds. Find out how a routine study on blue heron surprised even a 13-year veteran of the department.